Before we get started today, I feel compelled to voice my appreciation for those who have been kind enough to back the Terrifying Lies podcast by becoming monthly contributors. Backing Terrifying Lies at the 99 cents per month level are Chip and Tobias. Backing the podcast at the 9.99 per month level are Pat, Dylan, and Carl. Thanks, you guys. You really blow my mind. I can't express my appreciation enough in words. So, this is what I'm going to do. For all backers at the end of each season, I'm going to send you digital downloads of the entire season's stories with no commentary or commercials. I'll also include the featured songs. For backers at the $4.99 level, I'll throw in a digital download of the entire Old Hicks Hypno Nightmare, complete with the induction and re-entry sections, to make it a fully guided nightmare experience. For those who back the podcast at the $9.99 level for at least three months, expect to hear from me about where I can send a Terrifying Lies Season 1 t-shirt and an autographed CD of the old Hicks Hypno Nightmare. Again, thanks for backing the podcast. It means everything. And I consider you my friends. Well, enough of that. Let's get going. The Terrifying Lies Podcast with music and stories by Craig Nibo. Greetings and welcome back to the Terrifying Lies podcast. Today, I want to talk to you aspiring authors out there. First, hang in there. Finish your projects. Share them. We all can benefit from hearing your voice. Second, if you want some excellent and surprisingly free writing advice, I encourage you to listen to the Writer Dojo podcast. This podcast, hosted by internationally best-selling author Larry Correa and Steve Diamond, offers excellent tips all the way from writing technique and philosophy through business, contracts, and marketing. I know these two guys personally, and I can vouch for them. If you listen to the Writer Dojo podcast, and follow what they say, I can almost guarantee that your writing will improve and you will come away with knowledge that will help you not only finish your work, but make money in the process. Today, I'm happy to offer the conclusion of Old Hicks. This story is from the Hypno Nightmares series. There are six. I'm only giving you what I call the suggestion part of the project. The entire piece includes a hypnotic induction to get you into a relaxed, suggestible state, the suggestion, which is the story, and an awakening sequence designed to bring you out of a hypnotic state. The whole project was lots of fun. My intention? Guide you through a designer nightmare. If you want the entire project, you can get it at craignibo.com, either as a digital download or an autographed CD. With no more delay, let's get into it, you and I. Old Hicks, The Conclusion, written and read by Craig Nibo. take the stairs back up to the main level of Old Hicks. You and Roe exit the stairs at the end of a long hallway. The foyer lies to the north and around three turns. The other direction leads to the south wing of Old Hicks. You resist the temptation to head south. It's better to stick with what you know than to venture off into unexplored paths. You start toward the foyer. Before you make it more than a pair of steps, Roe grabs your elbow. We can't go that way, Roe says. It's the only way to the foyer. The foyer that is crowded with crazies? We talked about this. We have to take out Zara Yates. She was in the library. I think she'll be with the others at the exit. Based on what? Based on what every patient in this prison slash institution wants to get out. Roe grips a little tighter on your elbow and fixes you with a begging expression, flicking his eyes south. You remove his elbow. I'm going to the foyer. Do whatever you want. You head north. Roe reluctantly settles in behind you. 
Secretly, you're relieved that he decided to join you. Your only strength is in numbers. We blend in now. All we have to do is move through the crowd, you say, half trying to convince yourself. Once we take out patient 18, we can use the magnetic key to get out. You tap the magnetic disc in your pocket. Roll points down the long hallway toward the foyer. Have you forgotten? We'll be walking right past the infirmary. Don't forget that I saw Jameson and Edgar head in there. They're probably gone by now. Let's go. Have to keep moving. Ro catches up and walks at your side, wielding his broken table leg in a white knuckled grip, his eyes darting left and right with every step. You move in silence, except for the muffled rumble of the riot or party ahead. You slow down as you near the infirmary entrance. Ro walks sideways across the hall, keeping his eyes on the door. You follow suit thinking that Ro's caution is warranted. Together, you slide by the infirmary entrance. Looks like you're right, Ro says. Jameson and Edgar must be long gone. He lets out an eased breath and settles into an easier walk. Just as your nerves begin to settle, the door next to you whams open. You spin around just in time to see two men spring from a janitorial closet. Patients 15 and 14, Jameson Fennel and the emaciated war hero, Edgar Raymond both wearing white lab coats, probably stolen from the infirmary closet. Edgar leads the charge, holding a syringe in each hand, their stinger needles extending from his fists like a pair of twin ice picks. You raise your club, but Roe stands between you and the two patients. Roe attempts a frenzied, infighting strike. Before he can land a blow, Edgar collides into him, driving his twin needles into Roe's chest. The two men collapse in a tumult of awkward punches and kicks. You clamp down on your club, looking for a chance to brain Edgar. Before you have a chance to strike, Jameson Fennel jumps over the two writhing men and slashes at you with his scalpel. The blade slides through your upper arm. You backpedal away, raising your club. Have you ever thought about how holy the human body is? Jameson says with a little chuckle. <laughs> I mean, in your head alone, there are seven holes. He slashes at you with his scalpel, but is too far away to cut you. Blood pours from the wound in your left bicep. You're too afraid to look away from Jameson to inspect the cut. Two holes for your nostrils, two for your ears, one big hole for your mouth, and, of course, two holes for your eyeballs. He jabs his scalpel towards you twice, a pair of eye-level pokes. You continue to back away. Beyond Jameson, Rose screams, lying on his back, Edgar Raymond straddling him. One by one, Edgar draws new syringes from his lab coat and punches them into Rowe. Half dozen of the little plastic cylinders extend from Rowe's body. You wonder if the needles are new or if Edgar stole them from the used sharps disposal. And then you consider the rest of the body. Jameson says, all full holes, front to back, top to bottom. He gestures with his scalpel as if making the sign of the cross over you. He ends his gesture with a little snicker. <laughs> Funny thing is, he quickens his pace towards you, causing you to accelerate into a stumbling back trot. There's no limit to the number of holes one can create. He leaps at you, slashing from left to right with his scalpel. You sidestep his strike and land a hard blow on the side of his head. You wince at the sound of the table leg, making contact as he peels away. Half off balance, half from a thrown equilibrium, he winds his arms and sidles into the janitorial closet door. With a moment to survey the larger battle, you notice that Roe lies unconscious, at least a dozen needles jutting from his body. Edgar drags him away from you down the hall by one leg, Rose sliding along like a toy. Second by second, Jameson regains his wits. He grumbles something nonsensical and puts a hand to the side of his head, feeling the sensitive place where you clocked him. He shakes off the pain and pushes off the floor to more or less a standing position. You face down with the man, nearly twice your weight. Jameson raises his scalpel and crunches his face up into a sneer. Did you know that I used to be a religious man? I even went to seminary. I considered becoming a priest, but those sons of whores kicked me out when I tried to show them just how holy the human body can be. 
He grabs the hem of his shirt and pulls it up. A hatch of scar tissue crisscrosses the skin of his belly and chest. Everyone at Old Hicks knows that Jameson is a self-cutter. I tried to show them what it means to truly worship. God's plan for mankind comes to nothing more than pain. We're born in pain, we live in pain, we die in pain. He puts the edge of the scalpel just below his left pectoral and runs a long incision from nipple to navel, giving way for a wash of blood. He winces with the cut, but once the deed is finished, his whimpering turns into apprehensive laughter. <laughs> This, he points the scalpel at his fresh wound, is my pain. Question is, where is yours? He aims the scalpel at you. Have you found your pain? Or do you need my help to find it? Far up the hallway, Edgar drags Roe around the corner, out of sight. You feel certain that you could outrun Jameson. It's rotund and awkward. You could make for the foyer. The police were undoubtedly on their way, if not already in the gates of Old Hicks. Jameson Fennel steps toward you. You decide it's time to run, but you don't head for the foyer. You run straight at Jameson, raising your table leg on the sprint. He lunges at you with his scalpel, but you have reach on him. You bat his hand aside and roll with the momentum, spinning all the way around and coming in with a backhanded blow, bolstered by 360 degrees of momentum. Wham! crack him in the skull, sending him jittering away with a half dozen clumsy side steps. He drops the scalpel and loses his balance. Like a mountain, he comes down in a ball of doughy flesh. Before he has a chance to push up to his haunches, you're on him. You land a half dozen strikes to his ribs, groping forearms and head. At some point during your barrage, Jameson Fennel, patient 15, goes still. Either dead or knocked unconscious. You land two more good thunks before leaving to follow the trail of blood left by Roe and Edgar Raymond that leads to the end of the hallway and around the corner. You run around the corner and find Roe lying next to a loose med cart, probably either left there by a nurse or orderly when the fray broke out or stolen and pushed there by one of the patients. You glance around for Edgar Raymond, patient 14, and don't see him. He's probably, like a cat, had his fun with his prey and moved on. Putting caution first, you walk down the hallway, keeping an eye on the doors as you go. You don't intend to be jumped again. When you make it to Roe, you notice that he's still breathing, although Edgar has turned his body into a pincushion of used hypodermic syringes. Some of the syringes contain trace amounts of medication. You wonder what dosages of what drugs Roe has taken into his system, probably a mixture of everything from pain medication to experimental psych drugs by the quantity of needles jutting from his skin. Ro, you say, crouching down to him. You lightly slap him on the cheek. He doesn't respond. You remove the syringes one by one and toss them away. You aren't gonna be able to drag his dead weight with you. You're gonna have to leave him and hope that being dressed as a patient and playing dead will get him through the night. Something rattles from the med cart next to you. You look up just in time to see the cabinet in the bottom of the cart spring open. In the darkness of the storage compartment, Edgar Raymond leaps with a hiss. Hands out, eyes as wide and wide as a pair of eggs. You try to push away, but only manage to lose your balance and collapse to the floor. Edgar's lithe, almost skeletal body comes down on you like a bag of bones. His wiry limbs slap against you as he tries to overpower you. You manage to get a knee up under his chest and push him away. He devolves into a fit of grunting, screaming, and a flurry of scraping blows. He gets you twice with a pair of clawing scrapes, opening up the skin on one of your cheeks and just below your eye. You keep a cooler head and fight him. You push him further away with your knee and swing your other leg up over his head. He writhes and groans, trying to twist free. But with a few whacks, grapples, pushes, and pulls, you manage to scissor your thighs around his neck. One of his arms extended up through the triangle of your interlocking legs. You hook your ankles and squeeze down. He moans under the pressure of your cinching hold. He tries to grapple for you with his one free arm, but can't find purchase. You cinch down even tighter, hating the sound of your animalistic grunt and the fact that drool runs down your chin. Gradually, Edgar slows his flailing. 
keep the pressure on until his eyes turn upward into his skull and he falls unconscious. You hold him tight for a few more seconds for good measure before letting him go. When you release him from your scissor hold, his bag of bones frame flops on the floor. By the rise and fall of his chest, you know that he still lives. You can't just leave him and row behind. Undoubtedly, Edgar will awaken first and continue his macabre acupuncture routine on row. With some heaving, you manage to shove Edgar back into the cabinet on the bottom of the med cart. You shut the door and use your nurse's key to lock it. You drag Roe up against the wall and conceal him with the med cart, doing your best to hide his unconscious body. After hooking up your makeshift club, you continue on toward the foyer. You can't shake the feeling that the worst lies ahead. As you near the foyer, you see the fringes of the party or riot ahead. You draw in a deep breath and hold it, closing your eyes and focusing for a moment. You know that from this point on, you're gonna be surrounded by patience. You hope against hope that your disguise works. Something in the back of your mind tells you that when you run into any of the remaining frontal lobotomy patients, Rebecca Petty, patient 16, or Zara Yates, patient 18, your disguise won't hold. You steal yourself up and drag the broken table leg behind you as you walk into the fray. When you reach the outer members of the foyer gathering, you notice that it is more party than riot. A half dozen patients outside the administration office stand in a circle, clapping in unison. They take turns moving to the center of the circle and dancing. One by one, they trade gyrating solos. One of them spots you. You take on their attitude, trying on an aggressive grin. You hook your table leg under one arm and start clapping along. The spontaneous dance party erupts into a volley of laughter. They clap with even more enthusiasm. You clap and dance your way by, preparing for your final approach to the foyer. You take on many of the traits you've seen in patients of old Hicks. The tics, the self-muttering, the outbursts of unwarranted anger. You behave as insanely as you can. To your relief, the ruse seems to work. Nobody pays any attention to the slash in your upper arm, to the blood caked on your white outfit, to the bruise on the side of your head. Nobody pays attention to your matted hair, your running mascara, or the broken table leg you drag behind. You push the large double doors leading to the foyer open. Broken furniture, smashed glass, demolished books and magazines, unraveled toilet paper, urine, feces, leftover food smeared on the floor and walls, all swathed the room in which just a few hours earlier you were eating catered food, drinking punch, and fraternizing with Dr. Walter Freeman and the old Hicks administration. With so much confusion, you find a little more courage as you tilt your head sideways, cock up one eye, and skip like a little girl into the party. A throng of patients works the front door, pounding away with makeshift battering rams. Although they have demolished the finish, prison-like exit holds. You wonder if the police have arrived outside. You wonder if Barry Shriver, the hospital administrator, has been notified. You wonder where the staff of the other four wings of Old Hicks could be. Is it possible that you're the only survivor? One of the patients, a man with bushy eyebrows, a club foot, and a thatch of rat house hair fixes you with a cockeyed stare. You pretend to not notice him. Rather than try to disappear, you make a show by jumping up on a coffee table and striking the wall repeatedly with your makeshift club. You shout a series of nonsensical sentences made up of random words as you put dent after dent in the wall. The bushy-eyebrowed man goes back to his business. Someone in the middle of the party catches your attention, standing like a post, eyes locked on the front doors. You spot Zara Yates. You jump off the table and duck behind a tall plant. You can keep an eye on her. She exudes something calculated in her stare, focusing on the exit where a multitude of patients slams on the reinforced doors. You notice subtle movement in her hands, resting at her sides. They stir in a pattern, back a few inches, forward, back a few inches, forward. The throng of patients at the door seem to react with her gestures. As she brings her hands back, the patients lose their will to break out. They fall into their own models of crazed behavior. Some walking in circles, some stomping their feet, some clapping, some screaming, some lying on the floor. 
When Zara pushes her hands forward, they become a battering army, going at the doors with self-sacrificial impact, slamming with already bloody fists, kicking with already impacted feet. Some of the mob have injured themselves, opened wounds on their heads, skinned their palms, even broken their bones. But injured or not, they move as Zara Yates commands. Someone grabs your shoulder from behind, pulling you away from your reverie. You whip around and find yourself face to face with Rebecca Petty. You dry heave at her smell and appearance. Her face, hands, and arms are doused down with flaking, dry blood. Her coppery smell alone threatens to loosen your stomach and send your dinner up. You lose the battle when you spot what she holds, dangling to her side. From a lock of dark hair hangs the almost unrecognizable head of Marcus Quills. You wouldn't know Rebecca's prized chunk of flesh even had a face. You hadn't seen Marcus impaled on the end of a broom handle earlier that night. You turn to the side and throw up the catered sandwich and a red punch you ate earlier at the reception. When you look back up at Rebecca, she's smiling. The insane daze leaves her as she recognizes you. Rebecca Petty, patient 16, has spent most of her time comatose since you took the job at Old Hicks. Presently, she's more alert than you've ever seen her, fully cognizant, fully aware. She points, nearly touching you with the end of her bloody finger. She's here, Rebecca screams. She's here, she's here, she's here, 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 here. Before you can make a run for it, Zara Yates, still standing in the middle of the room, looks over at you. Her face cracks into the same smile you saw earlier through Rose's security feed. She turns her body away from the front door toward you. Zara, you shout over the mayhem. Don't do this. You don't have to do this. I can help you. I can get you special treatment. I might even be able to get you into release program. You know you can't come through on any of these promises, especially after what is happening tonight. Zara raises a hand towards you, palm up, fingers extended. You try to back away, but Becca stops you by holding up Marcus Quill's head. Zara cocks her head to the side, issues one more smile, then closes her hand into a fist. The party goes silent, and as if all of the gathered patients function from a central hive mind, they wheel around to face you in near unison. Zara! I never did anything to you, you plead. You hate it, but tears break free from your eyes. I was always kind to you, you turn and face the others. I was kind to all of you. You are telling the truth. Never have you shown anything but respect for the patience of old Hicks. Isn't that worth your life? Isn't that worth something? Don't do this, you plead. Please, don't do this. Zara raises her fist a few inches then slams it down. All of the patients come at you. Some trot, some run, some walk, some lurch, some crawl. You try to run, but a clot of them stops you, reaching with grappling fingers and closing their fists on your clothes, arms and legs. You fight with your makeshift club. For a moment, you even hold them off, but they keep coming. They crowd on you in a claustrophobic form of human thrombosis. All hands, breath, bodies, and faces, they crush you to the floor and pile on you in twos and threes. The weight of them becomes overbearing. You think about Dr. Walter Freeman with his ice pick and arrogance, how he tried to come on to you at the reception. Damn him for what he's done. Damn him and his sociopathic brain cutting. Damn him for giving the power to Zara Yates, patient 18, to take everything from you, your potential, sanity, even your life. As the crush increases, you lose the ability to breathe. Consciousness slips. You look through a tunnel, then a tube, then a keyhole. Everything goes dark. You wake to the sound of crickets. At first you fear opening your eyes, but silence tells you that the party has ended. No longer are the patients of old Hicks singing and dancing, slamming, breaking, muttering, pounding, killing. You gather your will and open your eyes. You lie face to face with someone bloody, blank, and barely recognizable. You stare into the bulging orbs of Marcus Quills. Your heart jump starts and you push back from the severed head that Rebecca, possibly under the direction of patient 18, left for you. 
You check your surroundings. You sit in a room defiled with debris, trash, and remnants of unhinged humanity. Outside, you see the telltale blue and red flashing of police beacons. Wait a minute, outside? You can see outside. The oversized double doors of the foyer rest wide open, allowing mosquitoes and the smells of night to enter the building. Did they finally do it? Did they finally break free? You put a hand to your pocket and notice that your magnetic security key is no longer there. But what about the police? Didn't they round up the gang of insane escapees and put them somewhere? You push up to your feet and walk to the open double doors. Four squad cars, all running, lights flashing, crouch in the street in front of old Hicks. People lie strewn like tossed rags on the institute steps, on the sidewalk, on the grounds, on the street. Gunshot wounds spot many of the corpses. At least six police officers lie dead, one of them with his pants pulled below his knees. Another, a blonde-haired woman, scalped and draped over a garbage can. You walk through the obstacle course of death into the realm of crickets, street lights. Someone sits in one of the squad cars. You trot to the driver's side door and look inside. A red-headed cop, no older than 20, looks up at you. His eyes bathed in fright as he glances over your bloody patient's uniform. Calm down, you shout at the kid. I'm not a patient. I'm a nurse. Please roll down the window. The cop watches you for a long moment, trying to determine truth from dangerous lies. After some hesitation, he rolls down the window. Are you okay? You ask. They're gone. They're all gone, the young cop says. It was a bloodbath, and now they're all gone. Scoot over, you say, using your most authoritative tone. The cop moves into the passenger seat. You get into the car, shift into gear, and drive away from old Hicks, leaving its looming Victorian architecture behind. Old Hicks housed well over 75 patients, most of them criminally insane. If what the cop said is true, you need to find help, and you need to find it fast. You hook up the radio handset from the dash and hand it to the red-haired rookie. He looks at it as if he's seeing the device for the first time. Call someone, you shout. Call anyone you can. It's going to be a night in hell. The cop takes the handset from you and puts it to his lips. He presses the button on the side of the handset and starts into a story that even dispatch will be hard-pressed to believe. This has been the conclusion of Old Hicks, written and read by Craig Nibo. For today's song, I thought I'd offer a bit of a collaboration. DJ Butler, best-selling author of the Witchy Eye series, is a good friend of mine. Like me, Dave is a musician. He planned to release a series of songs as part of the first book in his series. We got talking and thought it might be fun for him to give me the lyrics to one of his songs and for me to put it to music. To be clear, a song already existed. Dave had used his own folksy flair to produce an excellent recording. He's a big fan of old ballads, the real articles where poets told stories through music. To make the experiment even more interesting, before composing my version of his song, I made a point of not listening to his original version. We both wanted to see the difference between his and my interpretations. Today, I give you my interpretation of his song, Lion of Missouri. It's on my album, Glimpses, a collection of collaboratory songs I composed using lyrics from other authors. The wild bees of the gray green wood, bison, the sloth, and the wolf learn to hear his footsteps and light out in a hurry. His blade was sharp and his arm was strong. His eye was keen, his shot was long. The lion of misery. Same J. 
Jones, Nads and the Viceroy's man The Hesh and the Greek and the Turk Felt the white hot fire Of the young Cahokian's fury His word and his heart and his aim were true His iron will and his soldiers too The Lion of Missouri Against highwaymen and sorcerers Liars, land agents and banks He rode as hangman Circuit judge and jury his horse was fear and his cloak was all His look was deaf and his word was law The lion of misery This has been the Terrifying Lies Podcast. Please, come again. You're welcome here. <laughs>